Hi, I miss live theater. I'm sure you do too. So in this time of pandemic and, and social change, how can we exercise the same kind of tools that we use in the theater? Well, here's my take. It's a very long story short. I have a friend who is a descendant of both black African slaves brought in chains to America and white slave owners who bought or brought them here. Her grandsons, through the inexorable and indomitable alchemy of geography, genes, diligence, desire, luck, and most important, love, are now in line to inherit two Louisiana plantations. I find this happenstance, if happenstance it be, delightful and hopeful. These two young boys, and it's telling that I second guess my use of that word, are adamant that they are and always will be black, regardless of how they might be identified by others. I am hopeful that they may remain so adamant without stigma or discrimination. And I also take hope from their story that the melting pot, the sublime genetic stew, will finally rid us of this addiction to identities, both those we cling to and those we consign to others. I myself, by the way, seem to be white, at least until my genetic heritage test results arrive in the mail. I say I am Italian because it's a relatively attractive way to describe oneself, except, I suppose, of course, to those who hail from Spain or Greece or any of the countries that made up the former Yugoslavia or Libya or the Horn of Africa or who are Jewish Italian, but I digress. My point is that I have always been told that I am half Italian, quarter German, and the rest an amalgam of English, Irish, Scots, Welsh, Dutch, I am really, one might say, a child of Europe. But I say that I'm Italian. I can, I can say that I'm Italian because I do not look like I am definitively anything except white. I've profited from being white. I have been protected by being white. And I am hopeful that it will sometime soon not matter in the least. My daughters are Chinese. I mean, they are uniquely and unmistakably young American women now, but they were born in China, of folks I assume to have been Chinese, though as always, you never know. They are without a doubt seen, seen to be Asian by most everybody here in America. When we adopted them, I prided myself on how marvelous and, and noble it was to be proving the American dream. Then parenting came along in middle school. And then the pandemic, the China virus. My younger reported that some folks had started looking at her funny and giving her a wider berth than even physical distancing suggested was prudent. The American dream, identity. When we went to China to bring home our daughters, I would go out into the streets of Guangzhou and then come back to my whole hotel room, look into the mirror, and be startled that I was not Chinese. It seems to me that as comforting as identity can be, it is a construct and a fiction in the end. And by the end, I suppose I mean what both quantum physics, which I really don't understand, and also what many a wise and loving tradition throughout the course of our habitation here on Earth might describe the end as the now. The now, the end, there's no difference. Identity, race. <laughs> In the spring of 1965, in the second quarter of the second year of my college adventure, I surreptitiously abandoned pre-med 
and moved across campus to dramatic art. For my first acting class, I was to bring in a piece to perform. I chose a poem, a poem, as it happened, by James Weldon Johnson, poet of the Harlem Renaissance and first black executive secretary of the NAACP. It was from his volume, God's Trombones, Seven Negro Sermons in Verse. I gave them the creation, which starts with, and God stepped out on space, and he looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. I was 17 years old, never thought twice. It was an act of cultural appropriation. But I didn't know that then. At least I don't think I did. And there was no one there to school me. And I am, I am so, so grateful that I had that opportunity to speak those words, to embody that speaker, to, to try to incarnate that spirit, meager as my attempt must have been. I wanted to say something that I thought needed saying, to show something that I thought needed to be shown, and Mr. Johnson's beauty was what I thought was needed at that moment. That moment, then, now, the end, there's no difference. To say what I thought needed saying, I hope I still sometimes can do that. I am an actor, sometimes. I am Hamlet. I am a one-armed incarcerated predator. I am a 75-year-old London butcher surprised by love. I'm called to it, a vocation, a responsibility to try to search out identity, its signs, its sounds, the shifty smell of it, its rigid cage. And I find myself hoping that the stumbling movement forward that I sense on my good days, in my good hours, is lit by something more generous than identity, something more authentic, whatever that means, something that we all share, even if we cannot make words deep enough or wise enough or true enough to tell the beauty of it, to tell the story of it. I hope. Of course, hope. And a dollar gets you pretty much nothing these days, so I guess... I guess I'll have to actually do something.